Okay, uh, good morning everyone and welcome to the 60th meeting of the Local Government Communities Committee in 2017. Can I remind everyone present to turn off mobile phones and as members' papers are provided in a digital format, tablets may be used by members during the meeting. Uh, apologies have been received by Elaine Smith this morning, so our Deputy Commissioner unfortunately can't be with us this morning. And we move to agenda item one, which is post legislative scrutiny of the High Hedges Scotland Act 2013. And the committee will now take evidence from the Minister for Local Government and Housing on its po post legislative scrutiny of the Act. And can I welcome the Minister uh, for Local Government and Housing, Kevin Stewart, and his <coughs> officials, uh, Paul Coquette, Chief Reporter, and Julia Robertson, Julia Robertson, Policy Officer, Scottish Government. Thank you, everyone, for coming along here. This morning, uh, Minister, can I get to me perhaps make some opening remarks? Uh, good morning, com Convener Committee. Um, thank you for inviting me to speak to the committee today. Uh, post legislative scrutiny is a key part of the Parliament's work, uh, and I applaud the committee for carrying out this scrutiny of the High Hedges Scotland Act now. The Act was intended to recognise the detrimental impact that high hedges may have on people's lives and the enjoyment of their homes. The fact that there was no legislative solution in Scotland to resolve disputes between neighbours prior to the introduction of the Act means that it is crucial to monitor its effectiveness. The Act gives homeowners and occupiers a vehicle through which they can take positive positive action uh, to resolve disputes about high hedges when all other options have failed. It means that individuals are empowered to take action through their local authority, uh, which can enforce decisions that strike a balance between the competing rights of neighbours uh, to enjoy their homes. For a number of people, the introduction of the legislation brought hope that years, sometimes decades of stress and negative impact on their mental health and well-being would finally be addressed. However, I am aware from the evidence submitted to the committee and people writing to the Scottish Government that there are some people who feel their expectations of how the legislation should operate in practice have not been met. In May 2016, following discussions with Scott Hedge and local authorities, uh, the Scottish Government published revised guidance to accompany the Act. Uh, it was hoped uh, this would address some of the concerns that had been raised during its first two years of operation. However, a number of issues are still being raised and I therefore welcome the Committee bringing forward its post-legislative scrutiny. Uh, when considering high hedges, it's important to remember that the hedge owner and the hedge neighbour may have completely opposite perceptions of the harm and impact of a hedge. Uh, there are two sides to any argument, uh, but years of unresolved dispute leads to a greater and greater inability to compromise and the possibility of finding a mutually agreed solution which delivers a reasonable and balanced outcome diminishes. That is why both hedge owners and hedge neighbours need the Act and the formal resolution process uh, to fall back on when all else has failed. Uh, the Scottish Government is keen to listen to the concerns being raised and is open to suggestions on how the legislation or the accompanying guidance can be improved uh, to ensure it is working as it was intended to uh, and that homeowners can continue to enjoy their property as they wish to. Thank you, Convener. That's very helpful, Minister, for setting the context. And we'll move to questions now. First question from Graham Simpson, MSP. Thanks, Convener, and uh, thanks, thanks for attending, uh, Minister. Um, I just wonder if you can give us your uh, general impressions of how effective uh, the Act has, has been um, in the light of some of the evidence that we've heard uh, and the concerns that you've mentioned already. I think it's very difficult for me to uh, give a general impression um, of how the Act has worked nationwide. Um, what I would say is... Uh, uh, constituency MSP. Um, the Act has worked uh, well for uh, a number of my constituents. Um, there are still some constituents who are quite unhappy with the outcomes that they have experienced. Um, but um, I, I would say that in many circumstances where there have been disputes for um, a long period of time, it has been helpful to, to many people. Okay. Do, do, do you think um, councils have, have been working within the spirit of the Act. Um, as Mark MacDonald told us, um, it, it's really there 
as a last resort. Um, do you think, um, in some cases, it's not being used as that? Um, again, that's difficult for me to judge on what is happening in all 32 local authorities. But in terms of the spirit of the Act, um, as you describe it, um, the policy memorandum which accompanied the High Hedges Bill uh, stated that the principal policy objective of the bill uh, was to provide a solution uh, to the problem of, of high hedges uh, which interfere with the reasonable enjoyment of domestic property. Um, it does this by uh, providing an effective uh, means of resolving disputes over the effects of a high hedge uh, where the issue has not been able to be resolved amicably, amicably. Uh, between uh, neighbours. Uh, the best p potential, as far as I'm concerned, for resolving disputes uh, lies in the pre-notice stage uh, before the formal procedures of the Act start. Uh, that's where I think the maximum scope for resolution actually lies in this. Um, once uh, formal uh, procedures come into play, um, I would say it's uh, not so much the, the spirit of the Act, but the letter of the Act that comes into play at that particular point in time. Uh, and I think that you heard that in evidence from, I think it was Kevin Wright of, of Aberdeen City Council earlier on um, in terms of your deliberations. That was fine, Andy White, do you want to pick up on any of that? Yeah, thank you, Convener. Thanks, Minister. Um, I mean, that leads neatly on. You mentioned Aberdeen uh, City Council. Mark MacDonald last week told us that, um, as far as he was concerned, that a definition of a high hedge was as contained in Section 1 of the Act. And the evidence we've heard from those um, homeowners who are unhappy with the Act and their perceived, the perceived inability of it to deal with their um, issue have raised concerns with us about what um, actually is a, a hedge. Um, and I'm just wondering um, if you agree with Aberdeen City Council's observation that, and I quote, if the trees and or shrubs in question cannot be defined as a hedge in the first instance, the trees and or shrubs are considered to fall out with the scope of the Act. Well, there's been some debate about definition of, of a hedge over the piece. Um, and, uh, you know, originally in terms of the guidance uh, that was published uh, when the Act commenced, uh, there was reference to the Oxford English Dictionary definition of a hedge. However, um, officials received a, a number of complaints uh, about this as several local authorities um, were quoting the definition and using it as a reason not to consider an application. Um, at, that, at the time the Act was introduced, uh, the definition was felt to be adequate. However, if the committee feels uh, that the balance of evidence they are hearing supports a change to the definition, um, then I'm open to considering such a change. Um, but, you know, definition is always very difficult um, in these regards. Uh, and, I, I, I mean, uh, from my perspective, having um, sat in the committee, uh, that originally scrutinised the bill, you know, I think that di dictionary definition that has been removed from guidance um, was a, a, a good a, a good definition. Um, but I'm interested to hear what the committee may have to say on that, uh, and, and we'll look at that in terms of, of your findings. Just given your experience with the Act as it went through Parliament, um, is it your view that this is not an act that's designed to deal with trees and forests and woodlands and shelter belts? Uh, no, it's not an act designed to deal with trees and woodlands and, and forests. Um, and I think, you know, uh, as the committee looked at uh, all of this originally, um, uh, you could imagine the amount of things that came into play. Um, and we took evidence uh, not only from people here um, in Scotland, people with um, who had experienced difficulties, but we also took evidence from other jurisdictions as well. Um, there was an argument in certain quarters that, uh, at, at that time that the Act should cover single trees, for example. 
um, and we know that uh, certain other jurisdictions, including the Isle of Man, um, allowed for interventions when it came to single trees. Um, we felt that at that time, as a, a committee, that that was uh, unworkable. Um, in terms of your main point around about um, woodland, um, uh, you know, we took evidence uh, from the likes of the Scottish Wildlife Trust um, uh, around about these areas. Um, and that is why um, it was with the, the evidence that we received from other jurisdictions and from other bodies um, that the Act was written in the way that it was. So, so given that, and that reflects, I think, evidence we heard from our local authorities as well, that the Act was intended to deal just with hedges, specifically high ones. Um, do you agree with Aberdeen City Council that if foliage is not a hedge, it cannot fall within the scope of the Act? In other words, do you agree that the definition of a hedge is an important uh, element in the interpretation and operation of this legislation? I think the definition is, is a, an important element, yes, without a doubt. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I'm just going to ask to be follow up, we'll bring you back in. Yeah. Uh, Mr Simpson, can I just check, because perhaps the committee's been looking partially at this from, from the wrong angle. Um, if I put a scenario towards you, Minister, where someone plants uh, three or four small trees not horticulture, that's what kind of trees are, Mr. It's kind of irrelevant for the purpose of, 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 the, of the question. And it forms an artificial barrier um, which blocks out sunlight and prevents reasonable enjoyment to, to the neighbour. Does it matter whether that barrier is three or four small trees or a hedge? What is it that's so special about... I know it wasn't your bill, Minister, but I wonder what it is no, that's, it so, wasn't. That, 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 that's so special or unique about hedges about reasonable enjoyment of a property as, as opposed to other forms of plant life? Uh, this bill, in terms of its scope, dealt with high hedges. It was not uh, a nuisance vegetation bill or anything else in that regard. Um, the scope of the bill, and you know, uh, it, it's a question best asked of Mr Macdonald, who put it forward, was to deal um, with nuisance high hedges and not other, other forms of plant life or vegetation. Do you think the government would would be open? I mean, our committee have to deliberate on, on the evidence that we've heard, but uh, my gut tells me that, you know, if, if someone creates a, a barrier, um, you know, horticultural barrier between one property and another that stops reasonable enjoyment of that person's property, it doesn't matter a tuppence whether it's a hedge or whether it's trees, and the legislation doesn't seem to, to, to deal with with that. Well, the, the definition in the um, Act itself uh, dealt with um, lines of trees which could form a hedge. Now, you can have a line of trees that doesn't form a hedge um, convener. I'm not a horticulturalist either. Um, and this comes back to the definition of what is a high hedge. Um, uh, you know, a line of trees can, be, can form a hedge a line of trees uh, can be there and not form a hedge. Um, I think if we looked out of the window behind you uh, and looked across to the Scotsman building there, you can see a line of trees. Now, you know, some folk would look at that line of trees um, where there are gaps, and some would argue that that's maybe a hedge, and others would argue that it's not. Um, and this is one of the things about definition, and that's why I'm willing to look at anything uh, that you put forward in terms of, of de definition. Um, you know, the Oxford English Dictionary definition was there originally in the guidance. Um, it was re removed because it was seen as being too prescriptive, but, you know, that was the definition of a high hedge, as it was originally in the guidance. OK, that, that's helpful. Mr Simpson, you wanted to follow up on some of that? Well, it's the same point, really. Um, because when we spoke to uh, Mark, Mark McDonald, I mean, he, he, he confirmed that trees and shrubs um, are included in, in the Act. And the key thing is whether, not, not whether when they've been planted uh, are they a hedge, but what they grow up to be. Uh, do they form, do they end up forming a barrier that blocks out people's light? Um, and he, he, he was certainly um, of the view uh, in, when he appeared before our committee, that uh, perhaps guidance should be revised. Um, so, what's what's your thoughts on that? 
Well, I'm quite happy, as I said earlier, to look at the guidance and look at the recommendations from the committee. Um, but what I would say um, to the committee is originally the guidance had the definition um, in there from the Oxford English Dictionary. Um, uh, the guidance was changed because some folk were unhappy um, about that particular definition. Um, if you can come up as a com with a, as a committee with a definition, um, then I'm quite happy to, to have a look at what you come up with. Have, have you got that definition that was removed? The Oxford English yeah. it, it, dictionary definition. I don't have it with me at the moment. I'm looking at others. Um, not with us at the moment. It's quite a lengthy definition of what a hedge actually is, but we could certainly provide it to the committee. And you felt originally that that was uh, a better um, definition that, than one we ended up with? Well, uh, again, Mr Simpson, I, I think the key thing in all of this, um, as a, a listening government, um, that definition was removed from guidance because some folk felt that that was too prescriptive. Um, you know, if the committee um, decides that that should go back in, then I'm more than willing to look at that. Sorry, one more. Yes. You, you mentioned um, um, earlier that you'd issued revised guidance um, last year. Revised guidance in May 2016. Uh, convener, uh, because of the complexities of the guidance and the fact that I don't have full knowledge of every aspect of the guidance, even though um, it is in my briefing here, can I bring Ms Robertson at this point to, to talk in more detail about the changes to that guidance? Absolutely, Julie Robertson. Um, so the Scottish Government received quite a number of letters from people when the Act first came into force, um, raising a number of issues that it experienced with early, early applications. Um, so officials um, worked closely with Scott Hedge and also with local authorities to go through the guidance um, to try and identify if there was anything within that guidance that was perhaps causing problems. The Oxford English Dictionary definition was um, of a hedge, not of a high hedge. Obviously, the definition of a high hedge is within the legislation, but where the legislation says that it is a hedge, we were trying to define what that was, and that's what the dictionary definition was for. Um, we received quite a lot of correspondence from organisations such as Scott Hedge, who I know you've, you've had evidence from, that that was um, restricting the applications that local authorities were considering. They were sticking to the very strict definition of what was a hedge. And I think they were taking the same view as perhaps some members of the committee that it shouldn't matter if it's a hedge or if it's if it's another type of vegetation. Um, so in agreement with the local authorities in Scott Hedge, that dictionary definition was removed. Um, the guidance was looked over in detail by Scott Hedge and by local authorities and others. Um, and we also worked um, to get at the crystal mark from the Plain English campaign to make sure that it was um, easy for members of the public to be able to follow and to be able to understand. Okay. Do you want to come again, Mr. No, that's, that's enough, thank you. Okay, um, Jenny Goldruth. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, I have to say that I, I disagree somewhat with uh, Mr Whiteman and Mr Simpson in terms of the definition. The, the Act clearly states the definition of a high hedge, but where there is inconsistency is nationally in terms of how local authorities are interpreting uh, the guidance and the legislation. And that's the real issue that we've uh, heard evidence from uh, before today. So, for example, uh, with regard to fees, there are varying levels of fees across the country in terms of what local authorities uh, apply. Um, there's also an inconsistency with regard to who takes responsibility at local authority level. Some people have planning look at it, others send out uh, tree experts or whoever it might be to assess whether or not a, a hedge is a high hedge. Um, um, and there's also an issue around about timescales and how long that process takes. So there's a real inconsistency across the board at local authority level. And I honestly don't think that that relates to the interpretation of what constitutes a high hedge. So I wonder if the government might consider um, setting out more structured, I suppose, guidance to local authorities in terms of how this process is carried out nationally. Um Again, you know, I'm willing to look at these things, but uh, in terms of how local authorities go about their business or um, set fees, um, you know, uh, that is something for them. I, I think, you know, the committee itself, um, if it were, for example, um, to, to say that there should be full cost recovery um, for all of, all of these works, uh, may end up in a situation where um, fees rise dramatically. 
Um, you know, as it stands at the moment, my understanding is the cheapest is Inverclyde at 182 mm-hmm. pounds, um, while the fee in Glasgow um, is 500 pounds. Yeah. Uh, the highest fee in England, I understand, is around about the 600 pounds mark. Um, I think that you will have had evidence from some of the local authorities um, around about, I think Glasgow said that the fee should be the same um, as for a planning application um, because it's the same amount of processing um, and uh, also that there is a a greater ability uh, in terms of costs because of the rights of appeal. So if the committee were to want to try and create some uniformity around about fees, I think, you know, in terms of discussions um, with COSLA, which of course would have Mm -hmm. to be undertaken, I I think that you would find that the position would be, if if, if there was going to be a uniformity across the country, that that would be for full cost recovery, which might actually end up with a greater level of fees, uh, which may impede some folks from taking action. Okay, thank you. Um, can I ask a yes, of course. Um, the other kind of question I wanted to touch upon was um, various examples we've heard of uh, whereby people are served with a high hedge notice and uh, the neighbour then comes along and cuts down every second tree to circumvent the legislation. And the local authority comes back, carries out an assessment and says, well, it's not a high hedge because every second tree has gone. Um, Do you have a view on that? Uh, And do you think that we need to look again at tightening up that part of the the legislation rather the government does? Well, I'll I'll bring in Mr Kikait at this point (laughs) here, um, because obviously uh, in his role uh, and his reporter's role in the DPEAA, um, they have a a view on this. So if I could take in... Paul, please, convener. Yes. Yes. Uh, As I understand the position regarding the concerns about cutting down every second, every, every second uh, part of, of the hedge. Uh, uh, as I understand it, the position mainly relates to people who do that before the notice is served, in other words, to, to, to avoid that situation arising. It, it can happen afterwards, and I'll deal with that mm-hmm. in a minute. Yeah. But um, in the situation where it's, it's cut down beforehand, uh, that certainly uh, is a risk, and I can certainly see the frustrations of people who feel that they're in a process whereby the legislation um, is seen to be uh, circumvented or uh-huh. attempts to circumvent it. The, the the point the councils would make in those those circumstances, of course, is that technically those are no longer no longer high hedges. That does not, though, address the fact that un- underlying that that suggests there's still an issue to be addressed, mm-hmm. uh, and therefore the, the kind of role of pre-application mediation is therefore vital when you have a role before they serve a notice to try to get amicable resolution. That's what is a good thing, but Mm -hmm. that opens up the possibility that people take that kind of evasive action. It's quite difficult, I think, for councils when they serve a notice to do anything other than serve it on the basis of the the hedge as it stands when they serve the notice. If it's it's amended, if the hedge is is altered by Mm -hmm. the time they serve the notice, it's quite difficult. As far as the the experience of DPA is concerned, um, the the approach, I mean, there's a lot of flexibility in what we do because we're trying to to, to achieve a, a sensible resolution uh, of the um, of the issue before us but the the starting point from from DPA would be is the hedge is the hedge at the time the notice is served yeah. so that if if, if, if a, a hedge was was different either because somebody cut down part of it or just because after the passage of time, it looks different, or the impact is different. Then the 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 normal situation would be that the the reporters would seek to identify what the hedge was when the notice was served. I know there are some cases where they've sought photographic evidence yeah. at the time because it suggested it's changed in the meantime. So they'd make a judgment in most cases um, uh, in in terms of what the hedge was like at, at the time the the the, the notice was served. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Let me just pick up on a, a little bit of that. So there, there's maybe a number of parts within that process. So there's a pre-application, um, which could involve mediation, and that yeah. wouldn't cost either party any, any mm. money, would be my understanding. So at that stage, the the, the neighbour with, with the hedge may, may take remedial action and the problem may yes. go away, and that, that would be a positive thing. That, that We heard in the very first evidence session that there was a deterrence feature where that was yes. was happening in some parts yeah. of the country, and that, that was a good thing. Now, if that doesn't work and the application goes ahead, um, I, and just before the high hedge notice is served, the every second tree or whatever, as Ms. Mm-hmm. was saying, is cut down, 
is it possible to have the guidance and enforcement action always on the basis as if the neighbour had not altered their hedge in any way? And could that enforcement have been removing the structure entirely? Is that does, does that fly in terms of the law or in terms of the regulations? Mm. Because my thought is you, you would be that, well, you know, tough if you've ignored the pre-application, you've ignored the mediation, yeah. uh, an individual's put in an application, it's going to become self-evident that the neighbour's going to lose that one and inf an enforcement notice will be served and you try to circumvent that by tinkering with the yes. hedge. Yeah. If the enforcement would have been take the whole thing away or get everything below two metres or what have you, can that still be enforced in law? Yeah. Well, answer the second question first because the, the, uh, what, what, what the, the, the reporter will look at um, in, in, in making, it, making uh, a determination in these cases uh, is obviously the whole circumstances uh, and, and will try to achieve a fair balance in trying to look at, uh, at getting an outcome that, 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 that recognises the rights of both parties. If indeed what's happened is in the meantime there's been some suggestion that one party has, has acted in that kind of way, then one of the, 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 the issues for the reporter is to say that they can do two things, one of which is to remedy the immediate problem and the second, through the, as, as the, 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 the notice can do, the highest notice can do, it can set out steps to be taken to, to avoid the problem recurring. And I would imagine in that situation, if there's a belief that the, the uh, steps were taken simply to circumvent in the meantime, but actually longer term steps are to make sure that they can't just let the hedge grow again and start becoming the problem, then the notice could contain certain steps to try to, to, to avoid that situation arising. So the, the normal situation is that the, a notice would, would have two components, one of which is the steps that are to be taken to remedy the difficulty, and the second are the steps for the f to, to, to avoid in future it recurring. And the, the, avoiding it recurring might be the risk where someone takes steps in the meantime just to get around the notice. So if it was a hedge when the, when the, the, the appeal was taken, then they could, the, the reporter could deal with it and they could take that into account in, in, in uh, varying a notice, if that's what they, they, they choose to do, to try to minimise the risk that the person who's behaved in that way will simply then um, effectively ignore that by just allowing the hedge to grow again and become the, the, the nuisance that it was before. So there's, there's capacity and scope within the, the decision-making process to, to, to guard against that. Okay, now, now I do follow that. Yeah. I, I apologise for asking again That's okay, no. in, in specifically in relation to this. But if uh, the reporter was going to serve a notice on an original hedge which said, could that specify remove it completely or remove everything to below two metres? Yes, yes get... sorry, but, uh, yes. Right. Yeah. So it could do that, <laughs> yeah. okay? So the, the notice would specify what the remedial action should be. Yes. But in the meantime, the neighbour could come along and do something less than that, yeah. and the reporter could go, oh, that's OK then. Surely that's not acceptable. They, they could do that, because that, that would depend on the circumstances that would, it would arise. Um, they'd have to make a judgment as to whether they, 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 they would, they, they would um, uphold the, the notice that required the lower level um, to be maintained, uh, or, or they could vary it along those lines. Does but, the, so does the guidance say that the reporter should base an, a high hedge notice on the condition of the hedge at the point of application or the condition of the hedge at the point where the notice is served? Yeah, so, no, just to be clear, the, 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 the question, I think, was to do with whether it is a high hedge at the point the notice was served. And I think that, that's why that point is relevant. The, continued, the, 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 the fact the condition might have changed is a factor the reporter can take into account. So if the condition has changed, yes, they, 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 could, they could do that. I, I think, uh, Convener, um, we should maybe go over what would happen um, under yeah. normal circumstances anyway. Yeah. If there yeah. was no change, if it went to the reporter on uh, appeal, the possi possible outcomes from that appeal uh, are that the reporter can uphold the local authority's original decision uh, or high hedge notice. They could quash the decision uh, with or without issuing a high hedge notice or the high hedge no notice issued by the local authority or vary the terms of the notice, that is, change the work required or the compliance period. And I think that's what yeah. uh, Mr Kakeh is describing there. 
Okay, and so what, what's the what's the picture across the country then? Because, uh, Minister, you said that uh, in your initial statement you spoke a lot about the, the pre-application process. So um, how do we collect data across the country as a government to make sure this is having uh, the intended outcome? We've heard anecdotally from some that it's working very well, anecdotally from others that it's not working at all. I'm sure the truth lies somewhere completely in the middle. Um, but where's the data to back this it's up, a, other than it, 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 is it? It's obviously local authority data that you want rather than the appeals data. Yes. Uh, in which case, I'll take in Ms Robertson, please. Um, yeah, so the Scottish Government doesn't collect data from local authorities. Um, there was no requirement under the legislation for local authorities to provide that data with us on a regular basis, as with other pieces of legislation. We would expect that some local authorities will keep a record of the applications that they process, but we know that where an application is dismissed by a local authority, they don't tend to record that information because they don't view it as being an application. So local authorities would keep records of the applications that the that they accept, that they receive and that they process um, and then obviously DPA will keep records of the ones for the appeals but the Scottish Government doesn't collect any data on it. So there is data for the appeals when it reaches the stage of the DPA, but there is no data collected uh, by the Scottish Government or uh, no onus in local authorities to tell the Scottish Government each single piece of data. What I would uh, say, Convener, is going back to Ms Gilruth's earlier point um, if these things are added in, if these complexities are added in in terms of data uh, collection and then uh, a compliance uh, with uh, having to, to report to government, that would add to the cost. And again, I come back to the point of if you are going to look at costs and try and create uniformity, you know, in terms of uh, discussions with COSLA, if you were going to have a situation where you wanted uh, um, and I'm willing to look at it, as I say, uh, wanted us to collect data, analyse data. Again, that all adds to the cost. OK. So I'm not sure, Minister, whether the government should collect data or not. I'm just trying to establish what data currently exists. So any data that would currently exist would be at a local authority level. Do local authorities collect the data in the same way? It's a matter for each individu uh, individual local authority. I don't know how they would collect that data. Um, Mr. Doris. Is there a requirement for local authorities to retain such data? Not in the legislation. Right. So local authorities may or may not retain all the data. If they do retain that data, they may uh, have different procedures and processes for doing that. So even if they did report it to government, we could have 32 different ways uh, yes. that they could do that. Yes. So we're really stabbing fish in a barrel while we're blindfolded here without uh, any well, fish being in a barrel I, in the first place. I, I, so I, again, convener, you know, I'm willing to look at all of these things, but if you're adding to the complexity of this, the cost of this is going to be much, much more. And the cost of this, of course, falls on the person who is uh, asking for the notice. Now, I'm willing to look at all of the matters that are being uh, asked about here. Um, I will look at the findings of the committee um, very carefully indeed. Um, but if you choose to go certain routes, I think you've got to recognise that there are implications to going uh, on those ro routes if you require those kinds of changes to legislation and guidance. OK, can we put, can we put cost to one side for a second, Minister? Because we'll eventually deliberate, deliberate and report on, on this in the normal way. Uh, I'm asking for your thoughts not on cost. I'm asking for your thoughts on the fact that there's no requirement for local authorities to retain any data. There's no guidance on how that data should be retained, even if they did, and no requirement to give that to government, and no analysis has been done. And this committee is conducting post-legislative scrutiny. How on earth can we do that? Well, I think, first of all, before you look at anything else, um, you should ask yourselves as a committee, um, what is the benefit of keeping that data and collecting that data what, what does that actually what does that actually add minister can i stop you a second we're not asking the committee we're asking yourself as the minister what your thoughts are on that data and whether it would be of value so we'll ask ourselves questions minister but could you answer the question i asked you well i've got no evidence uh convener 
uh, which would suggest that the collection of a massive amount of data would actually help in dealing with the difficulties with high hedges. No one said it was going to be a massive amount of data. Would you be willing to explore the possibility of the consistent recording of data across 32 local authorities? As I have said to you throughout all of this, convener, uh, I'm pretty pragmatic about this. I'm willing to look at any of the findings of the committee um, uh, and look at that carefully. Um, but um, what I would also have to do um, is look at the implications uh, of adding to certain of these things, which of course I'm willing to do also. Um, but um, I, I would have to be convinced, I have to say, um, that there was uh, a real benefit uh, of adding to the bureaucracy, which inevitably adds to the cost which means that that falls on the person or people who are applying for the notice. OK, let, let's, I, I do want to push further on this, Minister. Let's try again, because I think there's a slight evasiveness there uh, in, in, in using cost in relation to that. Now, there's no requirement in local authorities to retain data. So let's say that that was up to them. Might it make sense to say to local authorities, you know, if you did decide to retain and store data, it would be quite helpful to the government if you did it in this way. It's not a requirement, but it'd be quite helpful to government to do it in that way. So at some point where the government, or this committee, for example, might want to conduct a piece of, say, post-legislative scrutiny, that may be of value. So do you see a value in that, Minister? Um, I don't know what the value or lack of value would be <coughs> um, in having uniform, uniformity in data collection across the country. And when you talk about the uniformity of that collection, that could cover um, a myriad of, of different ways of doing it. I don't, I don't see what the benefits are um, um, at this moment uh, of collecting large amounts of data about this and reporting it centrally when all of that is likely to do is give us an indication um, of how many notices uh, there are uh, in each local authority area, how many are upheld and how many are not. We get a fair indication in terms of data um, from the appeals that come to uh, Mr Kaket um, and where things are working or not working. So adding to the amount of of data per se, which will definitely add to the cost. I can tell you now that there would be no doubt in terms of uh, discussions with COSLA uh, about this, that they would say there will be an additional cost to this. Mm -hmm. um, in this case, that additional cost would fall to the folks mm -hmm. who are making the notice. Uh, and I don't know um, whether there's a benefit or, or not to that. Um, and I think that, you know, I have been, uh, pretty open here in saying that I'm willing to look at any of the recommendations uh, put forward uh, by, uh, by the committee. Um, so I don't think I've been avoiding uh, or anything. I'm saying that I'm willing to look at the evidence that you have heard uh, and the recommendations that you put forward. Well, Minister, I, I, I merely say that you spent two minutes there answering a question you've answered already, but not the question I just asked you there. Now, I'll repeat again. The question I ask you there is a pretty straightforward one. Local authorities may or may not collect data on this. There's no requirement for them to do that. Would it be helpful if they collected that in a consistent manner? I know what you said in your answer. The only thing you alluded to in my question was the fact that you don't see a benefit in local authorities collecting data in the same way, which staggers me, actually, because that's a huge benefit, and it's something that this parliament's been seeking for many a year. So do you think... I mean, I can't believe we're, we're having a disagreement on this one. Do you see a value to local authorities collecting data in a similar and consistent way, whether that's compulsory or otherwise? What I'm saying, convener, and I've made it quite plain, I thought, that if you um, or I, at a point, asked local authorities to collect the data in a similar and consistent manner, the likelihood is that local authorities via COSLA would come back and say that there was a cost to that. Um, that cost, I think, would end up being borne by the notice pair. Well, I have to say, I've had uh, COSLA given evidence to this committee and to the health committee when I was deputy chair of that. Whatever you're debating, they tell you there's a cost. That's what they do. That, that, that's their fallback position, anything you ask COSLA to do. I still don't think you particularly answered my question, Minister. Jenny Goldruth. Yes, I think you're, uh, yes, I think you're absolutely right. 
Yeah, I'm just somewhat confused when you say that there's certainly going to be an associated additional cost with this. We don't know that's going to be the case. And surely if you strip out 32 different layers of bureaucracy and put in place something standardised across the country, that actually reduces bureaucracy and it reduces costs because there's a standardised approach to how you do it. Um, I have to say, convener, that I don't know how each local authority is actually doing it at this moment. It's, uh, it may be an adjunct to other systems that they currently use. If you want um, consistency across the board, it may well be that a new system would be required to do that. I'm not uh, a, an IT expert in this regard, and I would not in any way, shape or form uh, want to sit here um, uh, and say how each local authority is currently gathering up that data, because I do not know. I appreciate that, Minister. I think our concern is that we just don't know what the picture is nationally. I mean, the Scottish Government has no idea what the picture is nationally because uh, Mr Kikett's only getting the evidence at the very end as it, as it stands at the moment. So you're only finding out once the process has, has happened. Um, so we don't really have an idea of what's been done before you get to that stage. Well, you know, you have got to look at this from the um, from the post -legisl legislative scrutiny side. Yeah. Um, I am willing to look at the recommendations that you put forward um, in that regard. But what I would say, and I repeat it again, and I'm sorry if I'm being repetitive, uh, but it may well be that that comes at a cost. Um, and in this case, those costs are borne by those folks who are applying for notices. Uh, would it be the co case? Possibly, that if those costs became excessive, um, that less folks would actually apply for the notices and would not get the benefit out of the legislation as is. I, I, um, in terms of the cost, I suppose we know that that's up to local authorities. So you're making quite an assumption to say that that cost is going to be passed on to the person applying. It's obviously up to the individual local authority how much they charge, not central government. So we can't assume they're going to increase costs. But it may well be the case that local authorities would increase costs. It may, but it may not. Uh, it may or it may not. Or I could go back to the previous line of questioning about cost and whether there should be uniformity of cost across, across the country. If it comes to the stage um, where um, folk are looking at full cost recovery um, for this work, um, as you know, may be the case in, in, in certain parts of the country and not in others, you may see a rise in cost if there is a rise in the bureaucracy around about all of this. But my point, my initial question there just coming in, was actually you're taking out 32 different layers of bureaucracy to have uniformity. So it's not really about increasing bureaucracy, it's actually about streamlining it and having a more consistent approach. And that gives us a picture that we need, which is a national picture to hold to account in this legislation. And we don't have it just now. Or, uh, convener, it could be the case that, as I said earlier, what is being recorded at this moment in time could be as an adjunct to current systems. And if you want the kind of uniformity um, that is being suggested, that may mean putting something else in place, which may come at a cost. Okay, so we've got a bit of an exchange on this. Mm -hmm. Can't, let's assume there's no cost to any of this, right? Let's say mm -hmm. the, the money tree exists, right? Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and, and it's cost free, and mm -hmm. we can press the button and get all the information. Mm -hmm. Do you see a value to having that information, Minister? It's not... Um, I think it's probably best to ask Ms Robertson, who deals with us on a day-to-day -day basis, whether there would be any advantage to government at all having a national picture. Because we have a national picture in some regards through the appeals process. Does that... Having each mm. individual application each refusal and all the rest adds to the government. Okay, the minister doesn't have a view in whether or not there's I'm, value I, to having information, but Julie Robertson does. Julie, that's not what I said, convener. Um, but Miss Robertson. No, why don't you? Okay, why don't you tell me again what you said, minister? What What I said is I don't know if it adds anything to us having the information um, from each local authority about how many applications that there actually are, um, how many are refused, etc., uh, etc. Et um, I don't know what value that adds. Miss Robertson uh, may have a, a view on uh, on that having okay, well, that value or not. That staggers me, Minister Julie Robertson. Um, I know that for the when the first anniversary of the Act being in place, we did write out to all local authorities to try and get an indication of what had been happening within that first year, how many applications, and we did get numbers back from them. But I remember I, it was a few years ago now. It was just around the numbers that they of applications that they had received. Mm. Um, we haven't had any need or any cause to go back to them to ask for that information in the last couple of years. Um, 
for other legislation such as the antisocial behaviour legislation, I know that local, there is a, a provisions within the legislation that requires local authorities to collect numbers, for example, say antisocial behaviour orders, and to provide that should ministers request it. They don't have to give it to us on a routine basis. Um, but for information like that, there's no there's no sort of set way how they should collect it or how they should present it. So, okay, thank you very much, Graham Simpson. Thank you. Um, as a former councillor. I would be staggered if councils did not keep this information. Um, I would imagine that all councils have this information. Uh, would it not be an idea if you simply ask for it and see what's out there? That could be asked for, as Ms Robertson has uh, already said. But, you know, in terms of um, a uniformity, um, and retaining that information at a local level, um, you know, that may come at a cost. As you well know um, from your days in local government, as I know from my days in local government, um, if central government at any point says that you must do things in a certain way, um, you know, uh, or use a certain system, that comes at a cost. In this case, um, Mr Simpson, as I've been keen to point out throughout, that cost is likely to go on the person who is making the notice, which may mean that there is less yeah. likely to be folk coming forward making the notices. I, I'm not suggesting there should be uniformity. Uh, what I am saying is there's probably a lot of information out there already. Um, whether it's uniform or not, it doesn't really matter to me whether it is. That there will be information out there that's already been collected. Surely it's just a, a matter of asking for it. Um, if you were to ask for it, you could pass it on to this committee. I'm quite happy to ask for that information and pass it on to the committee. That's not a difficulty at all. Thank you. Mr Whiteman. Yeah. Moving on. <laughs> um, coming back to a question you were asked at, at the beginning there, I think one of our difficulties in post-legislative scrutiny is the... Um, I mean, we've asked a number of people, we've invited and spoken to local authorities, but from the point of view of the users of this legislation, um, I'm quite clear that the people we've heard from are the people who are unhappy with it, in the sense that people who are happy with the legislation don't tend, on the whole, to write letters to committees about how wonderful it is. So I just wonder if we could return to the question about to what extent you think this legislation is, is actually working and as, has had a beneficial impact and has managed to substantially remedy many of the complaints that were there before this legislation was in place. I look at this um, convener from a constituency viewpoint where you know I've got the most evidence of what has happened. Um, I have a, a number of constituents who over the years have had difficulties um, around about high hedges um, and for those folks who have managed to get their case resolved through this legislation, um, they are very happy people. Many of them um, did not have to resort to the notice because when the legislation um, first came in, um, some problems seemed to resolve themselves. Um, I, it would be fair to say that I still have uh, a couple of constituents where the difficulties that they face have not been resolved um, because the um, trees uh, that um, are, are causing them problems uh, do not fall into that definition of being a high hedge. OK, uh, that, that, that's fine. Do you have a view on the, in a small number of instances, um, where people have bought properties where there's already a, a hedge there that's causes problems, whether um, that is a, uh, whether some, there should be some onus on those buying properties to, to, to be aware of any problems like that in advance of buying properties? I am not aware of any cases in my own patch around about that. Um, I will maybe turn to Ms Robertson or Mr Kaquette and see if they've come um, across any such cases um, that have crossed uh, their desks at any point. 
um, no cases like that I'm aware of. If somebody was looking to buy a property where a high hedge notice had been issued, that would be made known to them when they were buying the property. Um, I suppose it would come down to the individual owner, the person that previously owned the property might not have had the issue with the hedge that the person buying it would. If the person buying the house then had an issue with the hedge, they would be expected to undertake the pre-application requirements to speak to the neighbour, to perhaps go through mediation first, but not aware of any. As far as the DP is concerned, I'm certainly unaware of, of, of appeals, any appeals that have been taken which which that issue has arisen. Again, in terms of what the reporters do, uh, they try in looking at appeals to achieve a fair balance, uh, in looking at the, the, the right answer, mindful of the respective interests of, 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 of both sides. Uh, and one of the factors in, in that would be the, the, the fact that the, the, the hedge is pre-existing. Um, I think that would be a factor that would be reasonable and legitimate to take into account in deciding the, the, the outcome. In terms of um, the original scrutiny by the previous committee, um, if memory serves me well, um, and you may want to check on uh, this convener, um, there were um, some folks who came forward, not necessarily about um, hedges on neighbouring properties um, per se, um, but uh, wild woodland, including hedge, in areas where new build housing um, was going up and what the impact of that would be. Um, if memory serves me well, I think there was some evidence from um, the Scottish Wildlife Trust in that, and it may be worthwhile you going back and having a look at that. Okay, thank you. Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Convener. Can I now touch on, we, we have touched on appeals uh, throughout the morning, but I c can I ask some more clarity with, with reference to it? Uh, do we believe that the appeals process is robust enough? Uh, would be my first sort of uh, question to yourselves, uh, and then from that I can then follow on some others. Well, Mr Kikett and his uh, reporters are dealing with uh, the, the appeal, so I'll let Mr Kikett answer that. Thank you. Um, well, yeah, I mean, there's... there's, there's there's no real evidence, as far as we've seen from the number of cases we've, we've got, uh, to suggest that, that, that the way in which we carry out appeals is, is lacking robustness. Um, we have, as is, is uh, our record of number of appeals, uh, is, is broadly consistent with, I think, the evidence that was provided to the committee earlier from local authority witnesses about the numbers declining. We had a, a peak initially, uh, and the numbers have gone down. We've had 149 cases have come to us in total, of which 119 are effectively um, live cases, if you like, or cases that are required to be determined, uh, and that's, that's declined uh, over, over the piece. Uh, we know that we face certain challenges in, in the way in which uh, we, we, we require our reporters to, to determine uh, the cases before them. As I, I said earlier, uh, they're seeking to, to, to achieve a fair balance um, and uh, reflect the, the rights and interests of both sides uh, in coming to their, their decisions. And of course, very often many of the, the disputes are, are, are relating to very entrenched positions from the parties who are not always very keen to see a fair balance. They're keen to see an outcome from their own point of view. Um, uh, but certainly from, from our perspective, we see, uh, the, see no particular evidence of difficulty in that respect. What we do have to do sometimes, because we know that there, there can be difficulties between neighbours is, is unusually in this area, we find that we sometimes have to have more than one site visit because it's not possible to have a site visit with everybody willing to be in the same garden as each other at the same time. The only other bit of information I guess I would say, it's a relatively small number of cases what we've had and I, 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 what I would say I'm very grateful uh, that we've had no appeals beyond the DPEA the, the, there's the capacity to go to judicial review and, and hopefully long will that continue that hasn't happened as yet. And, and following on from that, do you think the Act should allow for an appeal in circumstances where the local authority has decided that it's not a hedge? In one sense, that don't, that's not only for me, because I deal with the operational aspects of things. I mean, I think I, I, as a general observation, there's no reason why that shouldn't be the case. I can see that people regard that in some ways as an oddity, that you can appeal against certain aspects, such as the finding that there's no adverse impact or the finding the server notice, um, but you can't appeal on the, what is a question of fact, effectively, as to whether something's a hedge in the first place. It's not always an easy question of fact, as we, we know, but it's, it's nevertheless a question of fact. The only word of, of caution, I would say, I guess, if I change along those lines, 
was 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 to be suggested um, is that um, because that is a matter of fact uh, and is a matter not um, not of discretion of the local authority, if the, a, a, a reporter were to decide that something was a hedge, then the question is, what do you do next? Mm -hmm. Did they refer it back to the local authority to start over again, or does the DPEA take over, in effect, the function of the local authority in exercising discretion as to what to do? Does it take on the dispute resolution process at that stage? So I think you need to think through reasonably carefully what the implications of that would be, not least because if DPEA do it, you've closed off the appeal route. Because they, they, we'd be deciding the notice at first instance and then the appeal route is, is, is excluded. So it, it would be a possibility to do so technically, but I suspect the best way would be for us, if we, agree, if we agree with the appellant that this is a hedge, that it be referred back to the local authority mm -hmm. then to re-decide. But that, of course, just adds time. And when we're talking about appeals against the decision, the, the Act talks about that can go to ministerial level. Have we had any that have gone that far and, that, and progressed that way? Well, well the, the right of appeal is to ministers at the end of the day, uh, and, and the legislation itself allows for ministers to, um, to delegate the decision-making process in accordance with, as happened in planning, for example, to delegate the, the decision to be made in the name of ministers by, by a reporter, and that's been universally the practice. Yeah. Uh, of, 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 of the, the government since the Act was, 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 was implemented. It's quite hard to see in some ways why, given the, the subjective element that a reporter would make in, a, in an assessment, why and how you'd work out which cases should go personally to the minister mm -hmm. to decide when that isn't normally the sort of role a minister would play by analogy with planning where the vast majority of cases are delegated to reporters for decisions. The most important national strategic decisions uh, are often called in by ministers, and it's quite hard to see which and why high hedge appeals would, would fall into that, that sort of category. Thank you, Convener. Okay, thank you. Can I just check, Minister? Um, Mr Stewart was asking about uh, an appeals process for the applicant if it wasn't deemed a hedge. Does the government have a view on that? I'm quite quite, Mr Kakep was quite helpful in terms of the complexities of that. But I, as I said, that? I am quite uh, willing to look at uh, the recommendations that you make in this regard. Mr Kakep has spelled out the, the great complexities there would be in that regard. Uh, beyond that, um, convener, um, again, we, we would have to look at the cost aspect of this because at this moment in time, uh, appeals themselves um, don't uh, cost any cash. Um, and if the DPEA is involved uh, in a huge amount more, um, then that's something that we would have to look at too, I would imagine. Okay, thank you. Now, the committee is appreciative that you'll look seriously at the recommendations that we make, but I, I, I assume, I mean, you may or may not agree with some of the recommendations we make, but I suppose what I'm looking for is that you also follow the evidence trail and you don't just respond based on their recommendations, but what the government's views actually are in terms of post-legislative scrutiny, that's quite important as well, because there, there's evidence to be receiving that not all is well with the legislation necessarily. There's a growing view that there might have to be changes in it. The government may or may not agree with our recommendations, but are you, Minister, and your team looking at the evidence they received because you may have your own ideas on how to change it. And that's what I've tried to tease out quite a lot today in relation to what the government's views are, as opposed to specifically looking at the views of our committee once we make an informed set Con of recommendations. Con convener, um, the government has been pretty pragmatic in terms of dealing with this uh, legislation. Um, and I refer you back to um, one of the in initial answers that I gave, um, because guidance was changed as recently um, as May last year. Um, I'm not sure um, if all of those changes to guidance were necessarily um, beneficial or provided some of the folk who thought that there should be a change in guidance um, with what they expected. Um, I think the other aspect of this, and if I go back to um, uh, previous days, uh, in terms of our initial uh, scrutiny of this bill as a committee when I was on it, uh, we recognised that you know there would have to be 
um, ironing out of certain things in this regard. Uh, and that's why one of the recommendations that we made at that point was for post-legislative scrutiny on this one. Um, the government is, is pragmatic. As I say, we've already made changes as, as it's, they have been suggested to us in guidance. Um, I will look at your recommendations and, of course, um, I would look at them uh, from uh, the evidence base. Um, uh, it may well be um, that if any other changes were required, uh, we would have to do uh, a fair degree of consultation uh, because uh, a number of the responses and the witnesses uh, that you have had um, are not necessarily the same folk that previ previously gave evidence. And I think that um, Mr Whiteman uh, hit upon a point in terms of some of the woodland etc aspects of this where again we would probably have to go and consult um, with some of the wildlife bodies as, as well as some of the folk that you have taken evidence uh, from here. But anything um, that I do in terms of that overview of your recommendations, if we were to choose uh, to do anything, we will do that on an evidence-based approach, yes. Okay, Minister, well, time is upon us, so thank you very much for your evidence today, Minister and Mr Kaket and Ms Robertson. Uh, thank you, the three of you. We'll shortly move to our next agenda item, but can we just suspend briefly? Thank you.
Okay, uh, welcome back everyone. I now move to agenda item two, which is post legislative scrutiny of the Disabled Persons Parking Police Scotland Act 2009. The committee will take evidence from local authorities and Police Scotland on its post legislative scrutiny of the Act, and we welcome David Brown, Service Manager, Network Management, Fife Council, uh, Campbell Dempster, Road Service, and Mark Henry, Road Service, North Ayrshire Council, uh, Chief Inspector Mandy Patterson, Police Scotland. Thank all of you for coming along. And apologies from Assistant Chief Constable Wayne Mawson, who understandably has other commitments this morning that he has to, to deal with. So thank you, everyone, uh, for coming along. We're, we're going to go uh, straight to questions. Before I do that, of course, I should say we've been joined by Jackie Bailey, uh, MSP, who was the member that took the original piece of legislation through Parliament. So thank you for joining us uh, thank this, you, this morning, Jackie. Um, can I maybe uh, start off just by... Um, asking where the local authorities present are in terms of um, converting advisory on-street uh, bays into enforceable bays. That would be a good, helpful starting point. Mr Brown. Right. Thank you, Convener. Um, I'll kick off. It's, uh, I think that's a relatively straightforward one for Fife to, to answer. Um, we had a lot of advisory bays on-street when the, when the Act first came in. Um, and we converted all our on-street bays to enforceable bays. Um, so everything we have on-street and off-street in our public managed car parks are all enforceable uh, disabled bays. OK, so good story there. Um, Mr Dempster, were you going to come in? Yes, thank you. Um, for North Ayrshire, um, we have converted all our, our on-street um, disabled parking spaces to, to enforceable bays with a total of... The 407 days. We've promoted four orders since the, the, the Act came in, um, and we review that regularly. Um, and we also have 187 off-street parking bays within our own um, council car parks that are also enforceable. OK, I'm, I'm just wondering, because obviously um, there, there, there's significant progress been made by the local authorities that we have present here today. That's maybe a bit patchier across the country. I'm wondering if you've got any views, and I, I, diplomacy is always welcome, but any views why other local authorities are, are perhaps been a lot more reticent in, in taking the steps that they're required to take in this area? Convener for me, I... I, I, I knew I would, if I, I left the silence yeah, long enough, someone no, would, would answer just, Mr Brown. I would have to say I'm quite unsure about that, um, other than that I'm aware that some authorities are moving towards DPE, which may be a method that's going to allow them to take steps towards that. So we're getting towards the stage where the majority of the 32 councils are taking DPE. And I think, you know, all things are, are, are entwined together. You need that enforcement to be there to allow the enforceable base to be promoted in a way that is, is worth doing it. Well, absolutely. We'll, we'll come on to enforcement um, uh, this morning. Can I ask, um, in relation to uh, private car parks or uh, you know private spaces where there's a, there's an obligation under the terms of the the Act to to uh, to approach these private car parks and these owners every two years with a, a view to working in partnership with them uh, in relation to making those bays enforceable? Also, what's been the experience of the local authorities present? in relation to that? Mr Dempster. Um, well, we have, uh, in terms of engaging with them, it was a, a notice that we put in the local newspapers asking if there was an interest uh, in them engaging with us for, for uh, us enforcing or, or making the bays enforceable. Um, we haven't had any uh, interest expressed from the private car park operators in that respect. OK, thank you, Mr Brown. Yes, Convener, um, we, we haven't followed the Edinburgh example of writing to several thousand um, authorities either. Um, we concentrate on getting our own house in order first, um, particularly the on-street and off-street car parks managed by the council for general public use, mostly town centres and shopping areas. Beyond that, we've done the housing areas, other council facilities and so on. Um, through that process, though, we have taken on board some of the, the, um, the hospital sites in Fife, and we're currently working with a couple of clinics um, who are keen to come on board as well through the DPE. Um, what we've done in terms of the wider two-year approach, if you like, to the private sector is we've put 
We have a page on our uh, Fife Council website, effectively, which is there 24-7, 365 days a year, um, suggesting to any private operator that wants to pursue this option with us to get in touch. Uh, and like my colleagues here, um, we really haven't had any uptake of that. What we do do is we have local discussions with um, private car park operators, such as supermarkets, for instance, when there is um, development discussions. So through our development management teams, we will tend to ask whether they wish to embark on, you know, coming under the wing on that basis, or how are they going to manage their car parks. And we've had no take up whatsoever um, through that process. So that's how our approach at the moment. Okay. We, we heard the last Evan session um, would NCP represented, and they, they'd said they they seem quite happy to consider working in in partnership with with, with local authorities. Um, now let me just double check the gentleman that we we, we had at committee um, last last week because I, I want I want to put his name on the record. My apologies, I don't have that in my notes. I've just caught my committee clerk out. I do apologise. <laughs> yes, it was D Duncan Bowens, managing director of NCP, and he seemed, um, apologies to Duncan for not recalling his name there, but he seemed really quite keen to talk to local authorities and say, is there a, is there a deal to be done? This might make sense. A lot of kind of car parks that are just, you know, not, not car parks in the sky, but just, you know, kind of open car parks with the barrier to get in. It might make sense to... To, to do some proactive work on this. So in relation to the evidence we've had there, would that, I don't want to target that company particularly, but there may be a number of companies that, that take a similar view. Is that perhaps an opportunity going forward for your local authorities to approach them or whoever the private car park operators specifically are in your area to take this forward? Certainly from North Ayrshire's point of view, we don't have any NCP car park private operators like okay. that. It's supermarkets and the like, so we wouldn't have an opportunity to take that forward. Okay, Mr Brown. Yeah, convener, I think we have one NCP car park that I'm aware of, one surface car park. Um, there are a couple of multi-stories associated with shopping developments that are privately managed as well. So again, I don't think there's a great opportunity in Fife to do anything with NCP. Okay, maybe, maybe one car park, but obviously yeah. other local authorities hope they're following this uh, this particular uh, um, piece of scrutiny and, and will be proactive. Uh, Mr Brown? Yeah, we just add to that. I mean, my experience of the privately managed ones in Fife that, you know, that are run properly by the likes of NCP or the shopping centre developments, they're well run and they do enforce, um, you know, parking out with bays and the abuse of any disabled bays, as mm -hmm. far as I'm aware. And I think one of the things we had in evidence uh, last week was whether or not the enforcement switches over to the local authority or otherwise to have some formal partnership agreement that's, that, that's evidence to see that conversation has taken place and there's effective enforcement, which is the outcome we're all looking for anyway in relation to this. Now, we also asked uh, supermarkets as well, to be fair to Tesco, I'm mentioning them because they believe that a good story to tell, despite us probing them at the last evidence session, in, in relation to this, there seem to be uh, uh, supermarkets wanting to protect their their own their own brand, their own quality of service, if you like, uh, within their own car parks, and maybe a slight resistance to working in partnership with with local authorities. Have I, either of you um, <coughs> deliberately targeted any particular? Do I have to name the supermarkets? Any particular supermarket chain to? to see what partnership agreements can be reached there? I have to say for North Ayrshire, no, we, we have not uh, actively engaged with them in that respect. It's only been a, an, an advert requesting an interest sure. from themselves, so we haven't actively pursued that. OK, uh, Mr Brown. Uh, can you know, obviously any discussions we've had with them have tended to be through the development management process when they're either doing alterations to existing premises or looking to establish premises in Fife and on the whole, um, they don't seem to have an appetite to have the councils run their car parts for them. I think the brand comes first, uh -huh. and I think they want to keep control of what is seen as their premises, their car parks. I mean, I, mean, I, was, left, the brand. I was left with an impression, it was a one-off evidence session, but I was left with an impression that 
supermarkets by and large would like to do the right thing they would like to go beyond whatever minimum standards would be it's just we're not sure in that sector what minimum standards does or doesn't look like if you're a person with a blue badge hold a blue badge holder who needs that car parking space so definitely opportunities there do you do you think this is something that, that you might go back and approach some of the supermarket chains, perhaps not individual stores, because I think one of the things we were concerned about is there's really quite busy store managers out there dealing with a, a thousand things at a time, but perhaps corporate affairs individuals within the large supermarket chains to see if there's a an opportunity there, whether at local authority level or even at a, a COSLA level, for example. I, I think I've been read... Uh, you know the, the evidence sessions you've had previously and seen all the issues that they're discussing, mm -hmm. I think it is something that we certainly need to consider, is taking that forward. It, it's interesting that you're saying around how they're looking to go a wee bit further than what legislation requires and things like that. If I can just throw something else in to, to give a bit of context, when, when we have discussions around supermarket and retail park developments at times, um, we often try to apply council design standards to layouts. So the type of layout you would expect to see in a public car park operated by your council, which will have very clear um, circulation routes and layout of bays and so on. Retail parks and supermarkets they often want to have completely different layouts, which we think are not best suited to the mix of passion, uh, you know, pedestrians and vehicles that you get in a car park. But on the whole, they always want to stick to what fits their brand, what is their layout, that's their way of doing it. Um, so it all sort of packaged up together in there that they like to do what they do it works successfully for them um, you know their customer is first the brand is there and that is how they like to take everything forward but you know I think having, as I say having seen all the evidence and the discussions you've been having I think there is an opportunity there for us to further engage with the supermarkets I should stress I'm not sure um, if I articulate that pr accurately I'm not saying they all want to go beyond minimum standards. I suppose the point I'm making is I'm, I'm not sure what minimum standards would look like or what that consistency would look like across the supermarket sector. And I think the point you're making, Mr Brown, is that uh, there's that balance between their corporate brand and what they, brand and what they want to do for, the, for, for their customers and what a local authority would expect in the planning and delivery process for an acceptable parking scheme for blue badge holder, so there's maybe scope for a bit more clarity around that. I found that, that exchange very helpful, but we'll, we'll move on with questioning now and we'll go to Andy Whiteman. Thanks, um, Convener. So, some local authorities have called for regulations to be amended to allow enforceable disabled persons parking bays to be created without the need for a designation order. Uh, does anyone have any views on whether that would be a, a good thing to do or not? Uh, certainly, I think that would be a, a positive step. Um, it would it would save a lot of uh, time and, and you know, the, the bays themselves becoming uh, enforceable. So I think that would certainly be a positive step. Yes, I'm fine for the equities, the comments from our colleagues here. Um, we, we have a seven area committee set up, which is where these bays and the orders for these bays would be reported to. So that in itself brings quite an onerous process. It's time consuming. It can be six to nine months from the time somebody is granted a, a bay, if you like, for a in a residential area to the point where it becomes legally enforceable. So you have that period between perhaps marking a bay on the ground for them to use it, but it's not actually enforceable. Um, so anything that could go towards removing that would be helpful. One of the downsides potentially, of course, is that statutory process is subject to public consultation and the interests of other um, property owners, road users, etc. I mean, are you, would you are you, are you, would you be concerned that, that other users of, 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 the, of the public road might um, not have the same opportunity to, to be consulted on such proposals? Yeah, I think, I mean, virtually everything we do now um, on the road network involves quite heavy consultation. Now, whether that's required by statute or not, it's something we do on a regular basis, is engaging the communities, locals, people that are affected. So I would just see it as an extension of that when we'd be looking to promote these bays. Mr. Whiteman, Mr. Dempster, do you want to add anything? No, I, would, Sorry, I, would, okay. I would echo um, what Mr. Brown said, yes. Okay, okay thank you. Right. Okay, uh, Jenny Goldruff. Thank you. Good morning to the panel. Uh, Glasgow City Council has called for a repeal of the requirement to engage with private car park owners every two years. Uh, does the panel have any views on that? 
Um, <laughs> I suppose given that we've not been doing it <laughs> because we see it as extremely onerous or not doing it mm. in the fashion that, say, your Edinburgh or Aberdeen has done, yeah, um, yeah we probably would, would say that that would be a, a, a good thing to do, um, to repeal that requirement to do it every two years. It's, it, it's extremely onerous um, on the council. Um, and we think there are other ways to do it, such as, you know, as we say, through local meetings where we have local contact anyway, and as we've done with our website. Um, we think that would be a good way to go. Yeah. I, 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 would, I would agree with that. Um, as I said, we, we have only uh, put an advert in the local papers inviting uh, interest from, from private operators. Um, there's been no take up in that, but I mean, we do have uh, regular meetings we attend that the kind of the North Ayrshire Access Panel meeting, and if there were particular issues that were raised, and there haven't been to date, but if there were issues that were raised in relation to abuse of uh, disabled parking spaces, then we could engage with a particular uh, supermarket or whatever. But we have never had to do that because we haven't had these issues raised with us. Okay, um, do you want to follow up on anything else? Yeah, um, it was just kind of a follow up actually, specifically with regard to Fife, um, which is, uh, as you know, Mr. Brown called for signage requirements. Um, in enforceable disabled persons' parking spaces to be reduced. Um, so I suppose, what kind of specific changes would you like to see happen in terms of signage then? Well, I think we'd, we'd be happy with the bay being marked and, and designated as a disabled bay, so the white paint mm -hmm. marking. So yeah. you don't need the pole and you don't need the sign that goes with it. Because um, the bay is relatively easy to get done, to get that on the ground, get it marked out. The pole then has to follow up, um, you know, it's slightly more, um, not engineering works, but you know, when you've got to dig a hole, so the info, you've got to start checking utilities, do all sorts of things, get that programmed. It takes a bit longer. Um, the only distinction with the pole is what we tended to do was when the bays were first put down as advisory, we'd mark it. And it was only once the order was amended and that bay was added to the order, we would put the pole up with mm -hmm. the sign. Mm -hmm. So that gave us a bit of clarity about what were enforceable bays and what were not. Yeah. But then again, if we just went to the point where all we needed was the bay marking, they would be instantly enforceable um, and we wouldn't need the pole at all. I, I believe as well the poles at times can cause um, disruption for the people trying to use the bay. It might hinder them opening a door or how they can park their car. It also adds to the street clutter as well, so it's something which we're generally trying to reduce. So if we could manage it without the bay, that would be ideal. Okay. Without the sign, sorry, mm -hmm. that would be ideal. Yes, absolutely, we would, we would agree with that. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you. Can I just, can I just add in? Of course, Mr. Mr. Henry, I'm not always, I, I can be, I, can have, I, I sometimes don't spot people wanting to speak, yeah. so please telegraph to sure, me that you want sure. to say something and I won't get you, Mr. Henry. Okay, then. Um, the traffic signs uh, regulations and directions has, has up, uh, been updated to, to, in the 2016 model, now actually allows you to, to have the bay without the sign in the post. Um, we, we're not taking away any of mm -hmm. our signs in post because there's, there's no requirement except where we did sort of actually take the, um, any bays that are on the traffic regulations off and, and, and are revoked. We will actually then go out to remove that. So um, that's been updated. Now, it doesn't stop you actually continue with that practice, um, which does allow you then to identify which bays are enforceable and which aren't enforceable. But it is a a resource and a, a, a commitment that, that the council obviously that would rather not have to do. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the introduction of having the markings only um, as a means without the traffic regulation order uh, to go with it would be a, a definite step forward. Yeah. But it does leave you in the position of how do you consult with the locality that it's going into um, as a follow up to that mm -hmm. when it does become unenforceable marking on its own. Okay, thank you. Okay, and do you respect, I promise you we're going to talk about enforcement shortly. We, 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 we will do, <laughs> but another matter we will pop first. Oh, Mr Stewart's got a question you want, want to ask. Can I talk about the sort of length of time and the processes that you have in place uh, to ensure that uh, a request for a new disabled uh, parking place, place is handled uh, quickly? Uh, so the sort of time scale that would take for someone to request and for it to then be put into place. Uh, and then for if one was required to be removed, uh, how long it would take for that redundant space to then be uh, processed? For North Ayrshire Council, it, uh, it, it, would, it would 
uptake from the, the moment the application actually arrives in the council and eventually lands on, on one of our technicians' desks, then the, the approval process for that is actually fairly swift. In terms of that, moving forward to, to the bay, becoming uh, on the ground, mm -hmm. can sometimes take a little longer. Um, we, we suffer from um, a, kind of a large amount of rain in Scotland, so markings have to go down when the, the road is dry. So quite often our uh, whole backlog of, of markings uh, programme can be restricted to, to only dry days. So uh, there, is a, there is a lag. The, 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 the time from the process of actually arriving on our desk is pretty quick. Getting, moving on to the next stage can take anywhere between one to two months, um, depending on the programme. And then to remove something as well? To remove something, we have we, we, our, our corporate um, fraud team deal with uh, the, the actual applications that come in and they inform us of when the bays are due to be uh, removed. Uh, and obviously we, we have people on uh, uh, out, maybe that, have, that somebody's deceased and they, they phone in to say that the, the person and the bay is no longer required. So, so we're, we're keen to, to keep that moving on quickly uh, because the management and the, the road space is, is obviously key for the roads department and allows other people to park in places that, uh, that they may not be able to if there's a, a disabled bay. So um, we, we follow that up and once again, um, taking out, out the road markings is, is probably another one to two months well. period as well. And are you similar in, in Fife, Mr. Yes, yes it's, it's similar time schools. I mean, when we get the initial contact from an applicant, the, you know, for the time taken for an officer to go and speak to them, visit them, and decide what they're doing would be a matter of one to two weeks to do that. Um, we do most of the disabled bay markings um, for residential areas ourselves, so an in-house lining operation. Um, so we have quite a degree of flexibility um, and ability to react. Uh, due to that, um, so again, it's you know within probably within a couple of months we would expect any bay to be provided. Um, occasionally, you get a bay that will throw up other issues, and there's mm -hmm. other things to be considered, or the resident may not want it where you're saying you can offer it, and it can take a, a little while longer to work through that and come to some agreement of where you might provide it. But um, the, the process is fairly swift. Um, in terms of removal, we don't always remove them. Right. Um, in residential areas, unless there is real pressure on the parking within that area, because again, there's a cost to remove it, mm -hmm. um, and the bay being there is a, a facility that anybody yeah, yeah. with a blue badge could use at any time. But in areas where there is pressure on the residential parking, and we've been asked to take them away, mm -hmm. we will do so. Um, there's also sometimes when a bay is given up by one person, the next person that moves in, if it's somebody that's moved out, may mm -hmm. qualify for a bay anyway, and in that case, the the, you know, although our records show a bay is provided because a specific person asked for it, they are public bays, but it's easy enough just to, to move them on. So, yeah. It's fine. Okay. That was very helpful. That says me asking my supplementary <laughs> question, which you've put on the record, because not a lot of people realise that um, the disabled bay is an assessment of need in that yeah. street and isn't assigned to a specific blue badge holder, and that can cause a lot of consternation, let's say, just just occasionally, but it's quite healthy to put it on the record. Jenny Gorith. Just as a supplementary follow-up, uh, specifically to yourself, Mr Brown, if that's okay, because I know you're here from the Kingdom of Fife, uh, which is obviously where uh, I have uh, my constituency. Uh, I have a constituency case at the moment, actually, with a housing association. I'll not name the specific housing association, but there's a number of constituents who live uh, in this area who qualify for a disabled uh, parking bay and uh, I wonder to what extent you work with housing associations to compel them to ensure that there is enough provision in terms of disabled uh, parking because in this scenario there isn't at the current time enough parking for them in that area. Okay, it's interesting to hear that because we do work with a number of the housing associations and generally if they want, um, well one, if they want us to mark the bay for them and they want us to add it to the order, we will do that. Um, I'm not so sure that we are putting pressure on them, if you like, to provide a, a fixed number or a percentage number of parking bays as mm -hmm. um, disabled parking bays. But, I mean, we do all, generally, the councils will work to the national guidelines that there should be, um, you know, 6% say within our car parks. And, I mean, it varies depending on the size of the car parks and so on, but we all work to that. And then in residential areas, we would very much say, again, it's the assessed need. If there's a need for those bays to be there. Yeah. You know they should be provided 
and it's, it's the able-bodied people that have the cars that mm -hmm. should be not necessarily disadvantaged, but should maybe have to work that wee bit harder to get a parking space and yeah, get back that's to the helpful. home. Okay, yeah. thank you. To tell your constituents that you've raised it at committee, and I'm sure Mr. <laughs> Brown might even offer to further discussions offline Absolutely, in relation yes. to this specific yeah. case. Let me know about that. That was a definite yeah. yes there, uh, Ms. Gorriff. That's yes. quite handy. Uh, Graham Simpson. Thanks. Um, I just want to. Um, I, I, I promise, Chief Inspector, we will get to you, but not on this question. Um, I just want to explore the um, different approaches uh, of the two councils here today. Um, North Ayrshire has chosen not to pursue decriminalised parking enforcement, whereas Fife has. Uh, so, so I wonder if you can both explain why you've gone down that route um, and what, what, what the impact of each of those decisions has had on blue badge holders and the misuse of parking spaces. Mr Bray. OK, thank you. I'll kick off. Um, we, we took up DPE, DPE powers in 2013, it was. Um, I think up to that point, we'd had you know, very strong relationships with Fife Constabulary, the police at, police at that time. Um, and I think on their front, they were finding it more and more difficult to prioritise uh, parking enforcement alongside all the other duties that the police had. Um, and we began moves at that time to take on DPE powers in Fife. Um, once it was brought in, um, as you say, we have, we have a, a parking warden operation. I think we have 18 wardens that cover Fife, effectively on a seven-day-a-week, mostly 12-hour shift basis on these seven days. And you know, a big part of what they do is look after all the, the blue badge enforcement across Fife at that time. Um, as I say, the, the, at the time when we moved to DPE, enforcement was less than what it had been previously, for, for reasons as I stated. Um, so there has been a lot more enforcement of, of the disabled base since we moved to DPE. Um, I think the written submission we gave gave numbers of how many um, penalty charge notices were issued for abuse of disabled bays. Um, off the top of my head, I think in round numbers, it was maybe a, about 1,000 out of 21,000 PCNs, around about those sort of numbers that we've issued on a, an annual basis. Okay. Mr. Do you want me to follow up with, with Mr Brown before I take Mr Dempster in? Yes, thanks. Uh, in about 2011-12, we carried out a, a kind of uh, investigation, a, prepared a business case in terms of looking at the uh, introduction of DPE. Um, we obviously had engaged with uh, Police Scotland in that respect, and we had their support if we were going to choose that route. However, um, it really didn't uh, add up for us and financially uh, to go down that route. It uh, wasn't it wasn't affordable for us, and we chose at that time not to, to pursue it, and ha haven't done so. Right. Um, so in the case of Fife, um, what you're saying is that enforcement improved when you took it on. Yes. Yes. Yes, yeah, most definitely. Okay. Um, and in North Ayrshire, obviously, we don't know what the situation would have been. We, no, we don't know. We, we do, if there are any uh, reports of, a, of abuse, and there, there aren't very many, I have to say, we, we would engage with uh, police, the police uh, to, to you know, carry out a, a check in, in, uh, on those particular cases. But we don't get a lot of complaints in terms of abuse of parking within disabled spaces. Would people tend to come to you, or, or, or would they tend to go to the police? They, I would imagine they would go to both of us. Uh -huh. um, uh, we might get the first call, uh, and then we would lay, lay, uh, raise that at our kind of local police liaison meetings, which we hold on a monthly basis, uh, or we may call the police as well to, to, to engage with them uh, if, if there is a particular problem. So, Mr. Mr. Brown, um, was it your council's view that um, police maybe have sort of better things to do, um, if I can phrase it that way. Um, and you, you know, in other words, this wasn't a priority for them, and that's why you felt you should take it on? I, I, I think it just, you know, with what they were being asked to do in, in other areas, it just wasn't seen as the highest priority. Yeah. And I think also because there was the opportunity for councils um, to take that up. I mean, we, 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 we've met regularly. Um, and roads liaison with uh, Fife Constable at that time. So, you know, discussions started quite early around DPE. It had always been there. Um, 
and it was, you know, I'd say it was about that time, 2010-11, through to bringing it in 12, that we decided to make that move. So, yeah, it was, I think, driven by trying to seek a better level of enforcement, um, because not only is it targeted at the, um, the disabled side of things, um, you know, the, just trying to get the town centre vitality in terms of generating turnover of parking spaces, make sure people were paying for their tickets and so on. Um, you can only really do that if you have a reliable system of enforcement that's in place and working all the time. Yeah. Um, so, Chief Inspector, um, I wonder if you'd like to comment on that, the sort of general view that the, the committee's heard, not just now, but uh, previously, that you know, may, maybe uh, police are not enforcing this as... Absolutely. First off, I'd say thank you very much for the invite this morning. Mr Mawson again would extend his apologies for, for not attending. Um, probably the first comment to make would be, absolutely, as a police service, we have varying priorities and events in la recent weeks obviously shows just exactly the breadth of um, priorities that we have to serve for the public. What I would say is um, what I tried to do in anticipation of the committee today was to get a flavour of enforcement activity that's ongoing around the country, in particular in relation to areas which aren't yet decriminalised. And what flavour that I'm getting back, I've spoken to area commanders around the country just to get a sense of how things are. When it comes to recording practices, there's probably a couple of call types that could come in, which would be assistance to the public or road traffic events. Now, there are 500 of each of these come in every week, so it's, it was impossible to break these down to see how many parking offences or reports we were getting on a, a weekly basis. But what I would say is how we tend to be managing these just now is that we seek local views on what is important at various forums, be it community council meetings, scrutiny meetings, and from there we work out what activity we're going to undertake. Just to give a kind of idea of what enforcement is going on around the country, I'll speak about my own um, area command that I used to cover, Falkirk. That, that one was one where we could actually break down the figures in terms of disabled parking. So our community sergeant, in response to um, local um, concerns, he did a three-month operation parking in general because that's probably the one thing, at one point that I would make for put forward. I don't get a sense that we are getting lots of complaints about disabled parking infringements per se, but we do have recurring um, queries round about parking in general, which we respond to. Um, so in the Falkirk area, there was a three-month operation took place. As a result, there were three, just over 300 parking tickets issued and 44 of these related to disabled parking infringements. Um, for other areas that, that I got feedback from, Ayrshire um, Division, they fed back that tourism tends to play a big part in when they get complaints round about parking, so they tend to enforce their activity round about that. And what they gave back was that in the year from April 2016 to March of this year, they had enforced over 500 tickets. These couldn't be broken down to give specifics round about disabled parking. Um, Murray, another area in um, which parking is not yet decriminalised, they have parking as a standing agenda item um, around their community safety strategy group. So police work in partnership with other with other agencies there around about parking. And again, just round about um, areas of decriminalisation, just to put some context round about that, there were colleagues that we spoke to in the Edinburgh area and uh, Greenock, and what they said was that where they, they get some feedback, they still work in partnership with some local enforcement officers, and they try and do the prevention piece, not just the enforcement piece. So they do education round about joint lettering, just to raise some awareness. Okay. Um, I know Mr Whiteman had a line of questioning in relation to this as well, uh, and Mr Simmons indicated that he was happy for Mr Whiteman to continue with that, so can we take you in just now, Andy? Thank you very much, Convener. Thanks for coming along um, today. That's very useful, um, Chief Inspector. So what, what you're basically saying is that you, through your community engagement, you assess the extent to which this is a priority issue for, for communities. Yeah, a common sense approach, to be honest. Common sense approach in, in relation to our engagement with the public. And what I've not, what I haven't um, maybe mentioned was, we obviously link in at a national level as well with disability groups. And the feedback that I got back from our safer communities was that while there are issues, parking was not one that was coming to the fore at that kind of level of engagement. 
Yes, because of course, disability people who need to make use of disability parking are in the minority, and the evidence we've heard from them is that they're not um, satisfied with the level of enforcement. So, beyond a general level of engagement with communities around this, I mean, how would a blue badge holder or, or a group of disabled people in a community who have concerns, how would you, uh, you know, address those concerns specifically? What we have is the process for people phoning in. Absolutely, if there are um, infringements, misuse of the, dis the blue badge, absolutely phone that in and report it as you would normally through 101. Um, the advice that our control rooms have is that if somebody phones in and they're reporting just a parking infringement and it's in a decriminalised area, they'll be referred to the local authority. However, if someone phones in and they're reporting misuse of the blue badge, then that would be raised as a call for dispatch. Okay, and what about persistent misuse um, of a particularly disabled parking bay? Would you elevate that and, and try and get more speedy response? As I say, everything that we deal with is dealt with on a priority basis. If we have an escalation of an incident, that would probably be sought through our community team. Um, because often what we see is issues, or I can think of one in particular in an area where I came from, where a an issue over a disabled parking bay led to an escalation of general neighbourhood um, issues. So absolutely, when there is something which is beginning to escalate beyond simply the issue of the disabled parking, these are issues that our community policing teams would be looking at. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, I'm just wondering in relation to awareness uh, in terms of uh, disabled parking, irrespective of whether the bays are enforceable or not, there's a cultural awareness and a, a lack of acceptance you would like to think in relation to use or abuse of disabled parking bays. Do you think we have to return to the thought of a of a national coordinated camp information campaign in relation to that? Should we have to wait until all local authorities are in the same position with enforceable bays? Or does that not matter? Do we just look at something meaningful now in relation to that? Because obviously one of the things that we'll do uh, in this piece of post legislative scrutiny we'll be making recommendations to government so it's just to get on record whether you think uh, a national strategy to make sure the public are clear that they shouldn't be parking disabled bays and the responsibilities they have because actually um, it, it, it should be a waste of both council officials and police time for dealing with the abuse of parking bays because people just shouldn't park there in the first place of course and that that is it's always every time we enforce a bay because we have to enforce a bay that that's a loss because uh, there, there's someone not getting a space they need to, to to have an equal access within society so any thoughts in relation to national drives or awareness campaigns mr Dempster? Um, i see we're not particularly aware of a problem within north Ayrshire. however uh, given the, the, the response you, you've uh, been getting from dis dis disability groups, I would suggest that uh, an awareness campaign was a was a good approach to try and resolve the issues. Okay, um, you, you don't have to have a burning <coughs> view on this. It's just to get something on the record. If you do, I'll, I'll take Chief Inspector and then I'll take Mr. Brown in. Okay. I would say absolutely. In terms of policing, we put out joint messaging all the time, and I have to say it always comes across very powerfully when it's not from a single organisation. So for me, there's there's a bit that. From a policing perspective, we can direct signpost people how they can report. So it doesn't matter whether they're decriminalised or otherwise. I think there are ways you could manage it that would that would make it clear for people how they can how they can get help. Okay, Mr. Brown. Yeah, thanks, I, I think there would be value in it. I mean, one of the things that strikes me is that every time we issue a blue badge, and it's, it's not something that my team does, but you know, elsewhere in the, the council we issue a blue badge, we give quite a quite an amount of literature to the recipient of the blue badge about what they can do with it. Um, we're not giving that same information to the drivers who don't have one. Um, so I think there is a certain level of ignorance around it about what, what um, people who don't have a blue badge can and can't do. Mm -hmm. But there's also a certain element of people just think they can get away with it. So I'm going to stop there. I'm going to be 10 minutes. But in that time, a blue badge holder may come along. So it's, it's a bit of both. So. Any sort of campaign that could raise awareness around those issues would be would be useful. Okay. Now I'm just going to give a, a, a name check for some um, 
uh, members of the committee who have still to come in. Uh, Graham Simpson are we going to explain a little bit further some relation to enforcement and, and the police will take you in a second, Graham. And I want to give enough time for uh, Jackie Bailey, MSP, to ask some questions. Can I just go back a little bit to the chat in relation to decriminalisation? And I think Mr Dempsey was talking about there has to be, look, we're in tight financial times, we have to look at the, I feel like the cost benefit and a business case for, for putting that forward. In terms of decriminalised in, in, in enforcement, I can see it might be easier in large built up urban areas and it might be more difficult in more remote and rural areas, but is there more clever ways we can deal with enforcement with, 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 with wardens? only deal with enforcement. I'm thinking of parts of, of my constituency where we could do with some uh, uh, enforcement and parking more generally, but actually um, you, you couldn't justify having someone whose job was just to do that enforcement. You could make a business case for that, but I'm looking at litter strewn everywhere and I'm looking at uh, supermarket trolleys half a mile away from where they should be and you start to join the dots and you go, there's got to be a job here for someone that could actually save a heck of a lot of money somewhere down the line. So just in terms of when you look at whose job it is to actually deal with decriminalised enforcement, have you looked at different models of how you would you could upskill existing staff to do to, to multitask in relation to that? Are there opportunities there? Or is it just me as convener get off on a tangent again and this wouldn't really work? So what, what do you think in relation to that, Mr Dempster? It's not something we've looked at uh, recently, but uh, yes, it's it's something that uh, we, we could look at. Um, we, we have recently introduced a, a litter and enforcement team. Um, you know, th there may be opportunities to, to to look at that and whether that could they could also be looking at uh, enforcing of, of parking. Um, but it's something that we would need to, to, to look at as a council and make a decision on that. Mm. And, and um, I suppose at the root of my question is: Are there other models of uh, decriminalised parking enforcement, which makes it more affordable for local authorities that you're aware of or you think you could point us towards. Mr Brown as well, I'd be interested in what you think in relation to that. Yeah, I'm not aware of any, any model that, that does the multitasking, if you like to put it that way. It's, it's, I think the, the whole DPE model is based on it being self-funding, self-financing. So you're striking that balance between issuing the number of tickets that generates an income that pays for the operation. Um, so that's how the DPE operates. If we were to start bringing in other activities, um, you might upset that balance. Um, we, we've discussed it oh, many years ago, maybe 10, 12 years ago, we spoke about in Fife about whether you could have one warden that does all. Um, and the practicalities of it just didn't stack up. Um, the, if you take the DPE, uh, all the parking attendants, you know, they rely on technology to do their job. So they have to come in, pick up the handsets, which is linked back to the, you know, the, the computers in house, which then generates the PCNs and DVLA checks and all the rest of it. So there's quite a hefty piece of technology behind sure. the DPE. So anybody going out and doing it has to have that. If you want to increase the number of units that you have and people that would have them, there's a cost implication there. So it starts to escalate when you look across the activities. Um, it's. It's talked about quite often, but we've not come across any real practical way of achieving that. OK, that, that, that's helpful. It was just a thought, Mr Simpson. Yeah, very quick question uh, for Chief Inspector Patterson again. Um, do, you, do, do you think it would be a, a benefit to the police for all councils to take on this work, given the extensive demands that you have on your time? It's tough to be diplomatic here. Obviously, there's no public service that now that would that would say no <laughs> to passing on the responsibility to someone else. That that's a given. But the reality is, we work in an environment, don't we? Where we work with local authorities. So for me, absolutely, of course, that would be a great win for Police Scotland. What we would say is that it would have to be something that was agreeable to both parties concerned. That, that would probably be the, the, the approach that I would take. Obviously, Fife have been very partnership oriented with the approach that they have taken. Others have different views in terms of finance. So it's probably not an easy one to answer, to be honest. But I think it would have to be something that we felt was not going to be of a disadvantage to the communities involved. That, that that should be the outcome, really, that whatever whoever provides the service ends up the community get the best. Ayrshire have obviously commented that they didn't think it was 
worthwhile for themselves to decriminalise, and I would say it's not for me to disagree with that. Um, they've carried out their, their inquiries. There is still activity going on, obviously, for our service. hope that, that is an answer for yourself. I think that's, that's fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, Mr Brown, yes. I mean, I'd, in terms of the police, I mean, uh, we operate the DPE uh, enforcement, but there are, you know, offences that we cannot enforce. And we still rely on the police to provide that. You know, if somebody's parked not on a yellow line, say, but they're parked in a dangerous position, for instance, it's not something that parking attendants under DPE can deal with. So you still rely on the police to come and deal with situations like that. And that's one example, and there are several where, you know, your DPE operation can't deal with it, and it still has to go back to the police. Mr. Simpson, anything else? Do you think you should be able to deal with it? Some of them it would be useful, yes. Yeah. Yeah. If you've got wardens out there yes. and you see dangerous parking, yeah. it just kind of seems crazy that you can't deal with it. You've answered the question. Uh, yeah. uh, okay. Chief <laughs> Inspector, without, without relying on your dip diplomacy any further, would you like to comment on that particular suggestion from Mr Brown as well? Okay, so we'd love to do that as well. This is, this is going to be a great mean for me. <laughs> <laughs> we have the power to agree nothing, I should point out to you. <laughs> I think we might just leave that one hanging yes. then, Chief Inspector. <laughs> uh, Jackie Bailey, MSP, thank you for your patience. Um, over I'm to you. known for my patience, convener. Absolutely. Thank you very much for inviting me along to the meeting. I wonder whether I could just pick up some points with you, because obviously at, at the time when the bill was brought forward, it was five years ago, so things have clearly changed since then. Um, I'm keen to understand in terms of enforcement. Certainly we said at the time where there were only, I think, five local authorities that operated decriminalised parking. Um, on, on that basis, we felt that the police's job was to be reactive, not proactive, and recognise that this would be um, you know, a, a less important issue, perhaps, unless you were experiencing abuse of, of, of a bay. Um, can you give us an idea of exactly how many local authorities have now decriminalised their parking? My understanding is that there are 16 with two in progress. That's okay. So, so the situation has changed. It, it perhaps potentially is less of a burden on the police given that, that yeah. parking enforcement is decriminalised in now half of local authorities, yeah. covering the heavily populated areas. I think Glasgow and Edinburgh and others are included. Yeah, Glasgow right? and Edinburgh are decriminalised. Okay, yeah. that's helpful to know. Um, in terms of, uh, and I don't know whether you have the statistics for this, but, but my impression is something like 85, 90% of the population conform to the rules. Okay, um, Are you getting repeat offenders or are you simply issuing one ticket and then the problem is, is dealt with by and large? I honestly wouldn't feel that I could answer that with any amount of accuracy. What I can say is since the introduction of our access to the Blue Badge scheme, which was one of the proposals from the last time we spoke at this, there have only been seven checks carried out by police officers in terms of suspected misuse of the Blue Badge. Four of these turned out to be being used according to the terms, and three turned out to be one was stolen and two were a fraudulent use. There are only eight offences um, in relation to misuse of the blue badge that we are enforcing. So for me, on a national level, that isn't enough to, to bring in repeat offending. Um, it, I'm not talking about blue badge enforcement. I understand people conflate the, the, the two issues. Um, I'm simply trying to get at perhaps if somebody has had a ticket for abusing a disabled parking bay, they might not do so again. Um, so it's really if there's any data to suggest that that might be the case. I couldn't comment on that. Okay, that's 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 fine. Um, can I turn to resources with the, the local authorities? Because I remembered quite tortured conversations, including with Fife, um, about the issue of whether there were sufficient resources at um, local government level. And there were conversations between COSLA, the minister at the time, Stuart Stevenson, and myself. And leaving aside the fact that some areas clearly were more efficient than others at painting bays. Um, were you given any additional resources for the first phase, which was going back and designating all your advisory bays as enforceable bays? No, that, that, that was all picked up just through existing resources, through our traffic management teams. Okay. Um, just, that, that just became the priority okay. for that time, and that, that was you know, one of the items that had to be picked off. 
Oh, because my recollection was the Scottish Government promised money, but there was a, an issue as the quantum of that money that was promised. There may well have been. Um, I can't, I can't okay. specifically recall that. Okay. But, um, you know, but in terms of um, if we take people resources within the service, um, it was all picked up within the existing resources there. So, so have you got a, a kind of rough sum of how much it cost in Fife to do, leaving out the staff that you would have employed anyway? Um, the, the one thing I do know is that we've spent approximately £217,000 on the signing part of the bays, for okay. all the bays we've done, and we, we put that in the, the written submission. The okay. cost of the lining wasn't quantified, okay. um, so I don't have that to hand. I wonder whether Mr Dempster or Mr Henry might shine any light from your perspective? I'm not aware of us having I mean, given any f additional funding. Uh, but I, um, I, I can't confirm that. Um, I don't actually know the cost of what... what do you have a no mark at all? I don't have a, um, an exact figure on it, but it was... Uh, within the service that uh, the costs were met by the service. Um, I don't believe there was any additional funding provided for it. Okay, but you all appear to have coped with that. Yes. 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 We had Excellent. To. Yes. Yes. Excellent. I always like efficient local government. It's a wonder to behold. Um, can I move us on to off-street private parking because that's been an area of considerable interest. Um, if you can cast your mind back five years before the bill was introduced, would it be fair to say that supermarket shopping centres had disabled bays, but they weren't enforced? Probably, yeah. yes. Yeah. yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Because I certainly remember bringing the bill forward that suddenly there was this rush of a whole variety of supermarkets competing with each other, and indeed, you know, out-of-town shopping centres all coming forward with wonderful schemes of enforcement, and indeed some of them took the, the money from the enforcement and distributed it to local charities and got good publicity out of that. I mean, is that typically what you think now happens, that whilst they may not have picked your enforcement scheme, that they are now themselves enforcing those bays because it's what their customers demand? Um, we, we certainly have some that do that. Um, they, they definitely enforce the bays. They operate robust appeal systems as well. Um, similar to what the councils do, and I think that generally um, the, the fine income, if you like, that they make, they reinvest it in improving the parking. Okay. So. I'm sorry, I, I couldn't answer that question. I, do, I don't actually know what uh, the supermarkets, etc., uh, do uh, okay. within our own area. So it might have been the consequence of the bill, and indeed, you know, any time you advertise or, or are in touch with them, that they actually may not choose the local authority, but they will choose to do enforcement because you've raised it with them? Possibly. Perhaps. I think, I think okay. they will look at all their sites on a, an individual basis, pretty much as we will look at our town centres on an individual basis and determine from that which ones have the issues, where do you need to patrol, where do you need to concentrate resources. So, you know, a lot of these supermarkets, big national companies, um, I think they're looking across their whole portfolio and reacting where they need to. Okay. I am aware that um, within North Ayrshire that some of the, the, the private operators, particularly the supermarkets, uh, actually carry out the enforcement um, and they seem to do it in a sort of um, remote electronic way so you're not particularly aware of a, an actual man with a high-vis vest or jacket on giving tickets out uh, and you'll actually get the notification through the post. Now, my understanding or my sort of perception of it looking from the outside as a, as a, a decriminalised, uh, not a decriminalised uh, and just an enforcement through the police teams, that if supermarkets had the choice between um, a local authority pursuing the, the misuse of the bays uh, and them carrying out their own enforcement, mm -hmm. that it seems to be that the revenue that's generated from that returns back to the supermarket. And if it was handed over to the local authority to deal with it, that revenue might be generated and returned to the local authority. So there might be an incentive for them to retain their, their own uh, enforcement. Yeah. Or to do creative things with it, which is give it to yes. charity, which seems to be popular with their customers at least. 
the ones that didn't get a ticket. Um, one final question from me, convener, if I may. Um, the bill obviously at the time followed the existing legislation, both in terms of enforcement and traffic regulation orders. Um, given that the regulations changed in 2016, the bill, I don't think, but I'll need to go back and check this, it was a long time ago, specified the, the, exactly what you needed to do, but referred to whatever the legislation was at the time that set out the requirements. So, it would be an easy change to make, would it not? If the requirements of the main piece of legislation changed, um, then you could take away the requirement for signs or whatever, because I've, I've just checked back on the wording, and we talked about signs or markings. So actually the new change would be accommodated by the bill as it stands, or the act as it stands. That would be the case. Okay. Yeah. Good. That confirms my understanding. Thank you, Convener. Okay, excellent. Thank you, Ms Bailey. Uh, any other MSPs get any questions they want to ask at this stage? Okay, that being the case, can I thank everyone for coming along now just this afternoon, a minute past 12. Thank you for your attendance and we'll continue for post-legislative scrutiny. I'm sure you'll, you'll follow it. We'll keep you up to date with, with the progress that we make. But thank you uh, this afternoon for coming to committee. And we now move to agenda item three. Um, Quite a lot still to get through, uh, uh, members. I think it was a subordinate legislation. The committee will consider negative instruments SSI 2017 forward slash 120 and 2017 forward slash 149 as listed on the agenda. These instruments are laid under the negative procedure, which means that their provisions will come into force unless the Parliament votes on a motion to annul the instruments. It should be noted. Uh, that the Delegated Powers and Law Reform DPLR Committee reported on SSI 2017 forward slash 120 due to defective drafting and therefore the Scottish Government brought forward SSI 2017 forward slash 149 to correct the instrument. The DPLR Committee subsequently reported on SSI 2017 forward slash 149 given that it breached the 28 day rule but found that this breach acceptable given that it has timidly corrected the defects in the previous instrument. The paper from the clerks provides more information on the DPLR committee's consideration. Due to the breach of the 28-day rule, the Scottish Government also wrote to the presiding officer on the breach of laying requirements, and this is also set out in the paper. So a lot in that there, eh, members, but no motion to annul has been laid. Can I invite members who may wish to make any comments on the instruments before us? Okay. Uh, there being no comments, uh, can I make mem uh, the committee to agree that it does not wish to make any recommendations in relation to this instrument? Are we agreed? Yeah. Okay, thank you. That takes us to agenda item four, which is the draft annual report. The committee will consider a draft annual report for the parliamentary year from 12 May 2016 to 11 May 2017. The report fulfils Standing Order 12.9 requiring committees to publish a report highlighting activities during the parliamentary year. An updated photo of the committee will be taken at next week's meeting to replace the photo currently featured in the introduction. So, best Bibb and Tucker for that, eh, members, for that photograph. Eh, can I invite members to consider the annual report page by page, invited comments as you go through the report. Um, so, bear with me and I will get my copy of the annual report out, members. Okay, now we can go through this, I would think, relatively briefly. Um, in fact, I'll just leave that hanging rather than discuss each page, which I don't think makes much sense. But you have it in front of you. I'll give you a few minutes to look through that. Are there any observations you wish to make at this stage? Sure, members have all read it thoroughly before they came to the meeting this morning. Um, our apologies to the wider public who have to look at photographs of us in relation to, to that report. Mr. Whiteman, did you want to make a comment before we we move on? Uh, no, I was just going to say I'm content. Okay. With the draft. Okay. In which case, um, uh, can I invite members to agree a publication date of Wednesday, the 31st of May, 2017, with the updated photo? Is that agreed? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I think that ends agenda item four. 
And we now move to agenda item five, consideration of evidence, which is a private session. So we'll move into private at this stage. Thank you.